Good morning, everyone. I'm Harpreet Kaur, the Business and Human Rights Specialist at the UNDP Asia Pacific and your host for the forum. On behalf of the co-organizers, it's an absolute privilege and honor to welcome all of you here today. And I can't tell you how delighted I am to see all of you here in, back in this room. You know, I welcomed over 5,000 people who joined us the past two years online, right being here in this room, and just like me and myself sitting in those seats. So really, 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 it's a pleasure to have all of you back here. And just so that we are able to run this for the next three days and longer, please make sure that you keep your mask on when you are in the meeting rooms. Uh, you can take off mask when you're speaking or when you're making an intervention and when you're eating, of course. We're not going to take away your right to food. Uh, but please make sure that you keep wearing your mask as well. Um, also, we wouldn't be doing this here and we wouldn't be able to really host the UN Responsible Business and Human Rights Forum here in Bangkok without the support from the government of Thailand. So we do have a message from the government of Thailand welcoming all of you. IT colleagues, can we please play the message? Thank you very much for the support of the government of Thailand. I feel very good and thank you for the work of the government of Thailand. The work of the government of Thailand is the work of the government of Thailand. The work of the government of Thailand is the work of the government of Thailand. The work of the government of Thailand is the work of the government การสัมมนาการดําเนินการธุรกิจที่มีความรับผิดชอบและเคารพสิทธิมนุษยชนครั้งที่4ขึ้นรวมถึงต้องขอขอบคุณวิทยากรและผู้เข้าร่วมประชุมทุกท่านที่ให้ความสนใจเข้าร่วมประชุมในครั้งนี้ซึ่งสะท้อนให้เห็นว่าทุกท่านได้ตระหนักถึงความสําคัญของประเด็นธุรกิจกับสิทธิมนุษยชนปัจจุบันประเด็นธุรกิจกับสิทธิมนุษยชนเป็นประเด็นที่หลายประเทศให้ความสําคัญเป็นอย่างมากเนื่องจากการตื่นตัวของกระแสประชาคมโลกเกี่ยวกับการแข่งขันและการขยายตัวทางเศรษฐกิจนั้นก่อให้เกิดผลกระทบทั้งทางบวกและทางลบกล่าวคือในเชิงบวกการพัฒนาเศรษฐกิจย่อมทําให้เกิดรายได้ที่เพิ่มมากขึ้นการพัฒนาเทคโนโลยีที่ทันสมัยหรือเพิ่มขีดความสามารถในการแข่งขันแต่ในขณะเดียวกันการเจริญเติบโตทางเศรษฐกิจดังกล่าวอาจส่งผลกระทบให้เกิดปัญหาหรือเรื่องของการกระจายรายได้ที่ไม่เท่าเทียมกันการเสื่อมโทรมของทรัพยากรธรรมชาติรวมทั้งการละเมิดสิทธิมนุษยชนเช่นสิทธิด้านแรงงานสิทธิในที่ดินทํากินสิทธิในทรัพยากรธรรมชาติและสิ่งแวดล้อมเป็นต้นโดยเฉพาะการดําเนินธุรกิจโครงการหรือกิจการขนาดใหญ่หลายกรณีส่งผลให้เกิดการละเมิดสิทธิมนุษยชนและกระทบต่อความเป็นอยู่ของชุมชนท้องถิ่นจึงเกิดการเรียกร้องให้ผู้ดำเนินธุรกิจรับผิดชอบต่อผลกระทบด้านสิทธิมนุษยชนดังกล่าวประเด็นปัญหาดังกล่าวเกิดขึ้นในหลายประเทศทั่วโลกโดยในส่วนของประเทศไทยนั้นรัฐบาลได้ตระหนักถึงความสำคัญและความจำเป็นในการแก้ไขปัญหาดังกล่าวจึงได้มอบหมายให้กระทรวงยุติธรรมโดยกรมคุ้มครองสิทธิและเสรีภาพเป็นหน่วยงานหลักรับผิดชอบการขับเคลื่อนหลักการชี้แนะของสหประชาชาติว่าด้วยธุรกิจกับสิทธิมนุษยชนหรือหลักการ UNGP รวมถึงจัดทําและขับเคลื่อนแผนปฏิบัติการระดับชาติว่าด้วยธุรกิจกับสิทธิมนุษยชนซึ่งคณะรัฐมนตรีได้มีมติเมื่อวันที่29ตุลาคม2562เห็นชอบและประกาศใช้แผนปฏิบัติการดังกล่าวพร้อมทั้งได้มอบหมายให้ทุกหน่วยงานนำแผนปฏิบัติการไปปฏิบัติให้เกิดผลอย่างเป็นรูปธรรมโดยที่ผ่านมากระทรวงยุติธรรมโดยกรมผู้ครองสิทธิเสรีภาพได้ร่วมกับภาคส่วนต่างๆทั้งภาครัฐรัฐวิสาหกิจภาคธุรกิจเอกชนภาคประชาสังคมในการขับเคลื่อนหลักการ UNGP และแผนปฏิบัติการทั้งในส่วนกลางและส่วนภูมิภาครวมถึงให้ความร่วมมือและแลกเปลี่ยนประสบการณ์ในการจัดทำและขับเคลื่อนแผนปฏิบัติการและการส่งเสริมการดำเนินธุรกิจที่มีความรับผิดชอบในฐานะผู้นำด้านธุรกิจกับสิทธิมนุษยชนทั้งในระดับภูมิภาคเอเชียและระดับระหว่างประเทศอย่างต่อเนื่องสำหรับกิจกรรมในวันนี้ถือเป็นหนึ่งในกิจกรรมที่กระทรวงยุติธรรมมีความยินดีที่ได้ร่วมสนับสนุนเครือข่ายพันธมิตรให้จัดขึ้นโดยมีวัตถุประสงค์เพื่อเป็นเวทีในการแลกเปลี่ยนเรียนรู้ประสบการณ์พัฒนาการ
และข้อท้าทายในมิติต่างๆเกี่ยวกับการดำเนินงานในประเด็นธุรกิจกับสิทธิมนุษยชนในภูมิภาคเอเชียแปซิฟิกเพื่อนำไปสู่การพัฒนาการดำเนินงานของทุกประเทศและทุกองค์กรด้วยกระบวนการมีส่วนร่วมของผู้มีส่วนได้เสียต่างๆทั่วทั้งภูมิภาคซึ่งกับผมหวังเป็นอย่างยิ่งว่าการประชุมในครั้งนี้จะเป็นประโยชน์อย่างยิ่งกับทุกๆท,ท่านและขอให้ทุกท่านร่วมกันแลกเปลี่ยนมุมมองข้อคิดเห็นและข้อเสนอแนะต่างๆได้อย่างเต็มที่เพื่อนำไปสู่การขับเคลื่อนประเด็นธุรกิจกับสิทธิมนุษยชนให้มีประสิทธิภาพรวมถึงส่งเสริมการดำเนินธุรกิจด้วยความรับผิดชอบและเคารพสิทธิมนุษยชนทั้งห่วงโซ่ผู้ทานอันจะนำไปสู่การเจริญเติบโตทางเศรษฐกิจอย่างเข้มแข็งและยั่งยืนต่อไปสุดท้ายนี้ก็ผมขอให้การสัมมนาการดำเนินธุรกิจที่มีความรับผิดชอบและเคารพสิทธิมนุษยชนครั้งที่4ประสบความสำเร็จและบรรลุวัตถุสงฆ์ที่กำหนดไว้ทุกประการขอบคุณครับ Thank you so much, and thank you, k u n n a r i l a k who's here also from the representative of, from government of Thailand. Thank you so much for hosting us here. You know, it is rare that nine UN agencies can come together each year, and we do take a lot of pride in bringing together the nine co-organizing agencies, the UN Forum on Business and Human Rights, each year. Trust me. Working together is a lot of work, but I think it's all worth it. Seeing you know what we're able to see here, all of you here in this room, but also people joining us online as well. It's also the forum. I think one of the key one of the key values that I see here at the Responsible Business and Human Rights Forum, bringing together and working closely with my other colleagues at different UN agencies. Is that we are each year also able to bring together different actors, and we are able to connect those actors with different agendas each year. And I think it's so important to see how the business and human rights landscape is, you know, growing, but also in terms of how different actors and agendas are connecting each year. And I think the UN Responsible Business and Human Rights Forum has done has played a huge role in doing that. Uh, and with that, we would also like we our regional directors from the nine UN agencies has a welcome message for you. So if we could just play that. Thank you so much. On behalf of the co-organizers, we would like to extend a very warm welcome to all of you to the 2022 Asia Pacific United Nations Responsible Business and Human Rights Forum. In the spirit of the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, this forum provides us with a unique opportunity. To work together to promote and deepen business respect for human rights as we chart a more inclusive and sustainable future in this post-COVID-19 world. To advance the business and human rights agenda in our region, we must be more ambitious. We must accelerate the implementation of the guiding principles as policy roadmap, corporate mission, and moral compass. This is to ensure that business respect for people. And for the planet exists as a core element of sustainable development now and into the next decade. Across the world, major changes are happening in the responsible business space. An increasing number of countries have adopted policies and legislation on human rights due diligence for businesses. At the same time, a growing number of companies. Recognize and comply with the UN guiding principle on business and human rights. To leverage these promising trends, we need more business and human rights champions from the Asia Pacific regions, with active engagement from government and businesses, as well as other actors, civil society, human rights defenders, investors, academia, and the youth. Actions for business and human rights contribute concretely. To many of the sustainable development goals, and they make a difference in improving the daily lives of millions of people. It is imperative that states and businesses respect, protect, and fulfill the universal human right recognized through the General Assembly resolution to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. For many countries in the Asia Pacific, this is a right that benefits from constitutional recognition and protection. 
While recognition of this right is a positive step forward, it must be accompanied by action on the ground. To trigger more concerted action, we should leverage the General Assembly resolution to encourage more protection for environmental human rights defenders and to scale up business action for a net zero future. The Asia-Pacific region faces a cascade of pressing challenges from the ongoing health and economic crisis to environmental degradation, climate change, and social inequality. To reverse these negative trends, we need to leverage concerted multi-stakeholder partnerships to unlock the potential of government policies and business innovations to protect people and the planet. This goal lies at the heart of inclusive and sustainable development. The ESCAP Sustainable Business Network has declared an Asia-Pacific Green Deal for business. I encourage all businesses to pledge their support to the Green Deal for business to enable the necessary green transformation in the region. This year, we celebrate the 10th anniversary of the Children's Rights and Business Principles, a milestone to remind us of the powerful impact businesses have on the children of today and the children of tomorrow. We have made progress during these past 10 years, good progress. But for the principles to reach all businesses, for the rights of all children to be safeguarded everywhere, the conversation must continue. The action cannot stop. We are calling on businesses, governments, civil society to chart the course for the next decade and make children's rights more and more visible in businesses everywhere reflect child rights in our initiatives, promote them in your regulatory frameworks, enforce them through your policy and investment decisions. Our work is not yet complete, but we can accomplish it together. While we can point to significant progress in recent decades, the social justice agenda faces numerous threats. These include the COVID-19 pandemic, climate change, rising inequality, high levels of informality, and economic crisis. We must protect hard-won gains and seek innovative new solutions to challenges in the world of work. Many of the tools we need are in place, but the continued commitment of governments, workers, and employers alike is crucial in our struggle for decent work for all. The pandemic has highlighted how effective recovery can only happen when it includes migrant workers who play a vital role across many different sectors that are imperative to the economies in the Asia-Pacific region. Irrespective of their migration status, all workers must be treated with equality, dignity and respect. To leverage this recognition, we must continue strengthening labour law reforms and ensuring transparency in global supply chains. Protecting the human rights of migrants is a shared responsibility we must all play our part. The roadmap to the next decade of business and human rights requires strong collective action to effectively tackle the main challenges and gaps in the implementation of the UN guiding principles. Key to this is enhancing the pillars of protection and redress, which are too often omitted in practice. To combat the persecution of rights holders, and the ongoing erosion of civic space, we need to leverage multi-stakeholder alliances that value and protect human rights and environmental defenders. These defenders are absolutely key to the success of the 2030 Agenda and to ensuring that an open, transparent and inclusive civic space continues to exist, if not flourish, in this region. Women and girls have been disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. But at the same time, there is a huge opportunity to rebuild a more inclusive economy and women need to be at the centre of this. There is a tremendous opportunity for businesses of all sizes and sectors to advance women's economic empowerment across their value chains, from leadership to workplaces, marketplaces and at the community level for more sustainable and inclusive growth. Let us work together to make the future more inclusive, equitable and truly sustainable for a planet and its people. Let us act together to build forward better.
to identify fair and durable solutions for the people of today and for the generations of tomorrow. Let us lead together to harness the levers of change for business and human rights, for the rights of all people everywhere. Now. now. Thank you very much. We are joined at this forum uh, about 2,000 registrations representing almost more than 100 plus countries, but also representing stakeholders from business, from academia, from CSOs, from government, civil society organizations, human rights defenders, and many more. Over the next three days, we will have almost 25 sessions with over 120 speakers. And I think uh, also taking a lot of pride in here saying that we do have a lot more speakers this year. We have about 65% women speakers. I've had one of my co-organizing agencies saying, Harpreet, we have a problem. I was like, what's going on? We can't, we don't have a gender balance at my panel. And I was like, what are we gonna do? I was like, maybe, you know, let's try to find a woman. And that comes with the gender biases and stereotypes here. But then I was told they couldn't find a man for their panel. So we do have some really, really good, you know, we do have some really strong speakers, but I'm taking a lot of pride here in saying that we do have a lot more participation from women, not just among the speakers, but also the participants. So thank you, everyone. This is to all the women joining us as speakers and as uh, participants as well. And with that, I'm going to give some house rules, and then I'm going to hand it over to my colleague. As I said, please keep your mask on if you're not speaking or if you're not eating, especially in the meeting rooms. Uh, we're going to use these lanyards again next year. Uh, so please make sure when you're leaving the last day, there would be boxes outside. We're going to get all of these dry clean and sanitized. But we do want to sort of start using these lanyards and all the material that we print for the forum uh, next year so that at least you know, we, we are a little bit more sustainable or we could try to be a bit more sustainable as well. At the UN building, it's a no plastic area. So you will not find any plastic bottles or even any glasses for water. So you do have a flask in your bags. Please make sure to bring it every single day and use that there are uh, water tanks and you can fill you know you can get water from here as well uh, any more clown rules please be here on time as well so thank you so much for joining us uh, and with that i would like to pass it on to my colleague clevio sarandria who's the UNDP's uh, global business and human rights advisor who would also moderate the high level opening plenary for today thanks clevio over to you Thank you. Thank you, Harpreet, and, and indeed a very warm welcome to, uh, to those present here and indeed to the many, many joining us uh, online to the opening plenary of the sixth regional forum on business and human rights held here in Bangkok. Indeed, it is the fourth which we co-organize with many UN actors, but the sixth that is organized here at HESCAP by, by some of us. And, and what a pleasure to see, uh, finally seeing people filling up again a room after two years of exclusively virtual interaction. What, what a pleasure to recognize uh, many new faces, but also some uh, very familiar, old, if I may so, say so, faces, including some on, on my table, people that were here with me in this same room in 2017 when we launched the first uh, regional forum on business and human rights uh, for, for Asia Pacific. Now, looking back at these six years uh, uh, of, of discourse around responsible business practices in Asia Pacific, we see some clear uh, evidence of progress, which does comfort us. I remember actually one of the first formal was subtitled in itself, evidence of progress. And this evidence of progress keeps showing, but also we clearly see not enough change into the life of the rights holders to be truly optimistic. There is consensus on the fact that the speed, the breadth, the depth of such change has clearly not reached yet the desired level. However, like many others, uh, I've traveled a lot around Asia, a little less in the last two years, but I've started traveling again around Asia because of my role. And I've been in contact with government officials, with businesses, with civil society, indigenous people, human rights defenders, community leaders. And the feeling that I am gathering is that against the picture that it is indeed, unfortunately, 
too dark, a number of good opportunities are also there for us all to uh, seize and liver, to, so to speak, move up gear. For this reason, we chose to subtitle the forum this year, Harnessing Levers of Change. And it is of these levers of change uh, that I would like to uh, speak today. Levers of change from uh, hardenings of, on, on norms on human rights due diligence or the connection between human rights and, and the right to a healthy, clean and safe environment that I would like to discuss today with an exceptional panel of analysts, experts and practitioners. So let me start by introducing them all, one by one, after which I will give the floor to each of them for them to share some, some reflections and, and ask for questions and comments, uh, which we will hopefully have the time to collect from the floor. So let me start from my right, and I, I have a big pleasure to introduce Dr. Pichamon Yeopantong, who is a member of the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights, recently appointed in representation of the Asia region. Also on my right, His Excellency Mr. John Astrom Grondhal, who is the Swedish ambassador to Thailand. Thank you for joining us, Ambassador. Uh, going on my right side now, and I'll come back to the, to the left, of course, but on my right side, Professor Tomoya Obokata, UN Special Rapporteur on Contemporary Forms of Slavery. Thank you for joining us, Professor Tomoya. Also on my right side, uh, uh, the old friend, Ms. Narilak Parchayapum, Director of International Human Rights Division, Rights and Liberties Protection Department, Ministry of Just Justice of the Government of Thailand. Uh, on the left side, uh, on the, the last seat, Ms. Marie Joyce Godio, Legal Defense Fund Coordinator and Support to Advocacy Team of the Indigenous People Rights International. Right, uh, uh, last but not least, indeed, a representative from uh, the business, which is very relevant, obviously, on, on, on an event on business and human rights, Ms. Shunsmita Anis, Vice, Vice President of the Bangladesh Employers Federation. Thank you, thank you very much, Ms. Shumsita, for joining us. Now, with no further ado, having, having covered the presentation, let me proceed to give the floor to the first of our speaker, who is uh, Kun Pichamon. Now, Dr. Pichamon, the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights, presented in December last year, after one year of, of consultations, including a year in Asia, a roadmap for the next decade of implementation of the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. And this, this, next, this uh, document is very rich in listing potential levers of change. In fact, it counts uh, tens of such uh, uh, recommendations. Now, help us in placing those recommendations in the context of Asia. What are, in your views, the short, mid and long term levers of change which are available, in your view, to different stakeholders in the region? The floor is yours, Kun uh, Sure. No, thank you so much for that, Livio, uh, for your question. I have to say, drawing up the roadmap and undertaking the stock-taking exercise that informs it was really a Herculean task uh, for the working group as well as the secretariat involved. The end product is a rather hefty document uh, that sets out eight priority action areas from leveraging the UNGPs, UN Guiding Principles, as a compass to meet global challenges through to doing stakeholder engagement better and global cooperation better as well. Now, I won't go into each of them here, um, but what I'd like to do really is to take a step back and think more holistically about what the roadmap tells us about the levers of change that we are seeing in this region. Let's start with the long-term lever here. Fundamentally underpinning each of the priority action areas, each recommendation is really human agency. Without the willpower on the part of states to assume the mantle of responsibility, companies to take up leadership, and human rights defenders to uphold both state and corporate accountability, there would be no future for the business and human rights agenda. Indeed, looking into the audience here today makes for a really remarkable sight, not just because this is the first time that I've been back in such a big room with people after COVID, but also to see so many people here from all walks of life as champions, as supporters of the BHR agenda, gives genuine cause for optimism. 
It also provides cause for long-term sustainable change, change that sees the UNGPs become, as I mentioned previously in the video, policy roadmap, corporate mission, and moral compass. It's important to note here that Asia is in fact one of the regions with the most concentration of efforts when it comes to the implementation of the UNGPs, as we see from regional dialogues, this one being a case in point. And the ambition, ambition that we see here in this region as well gives us hope for the future. Thinking about midterm levers though, I cannot help but reflect on what I've been hearing from the different discussions and consultations that have been happening here and beyond this forum. I hear from states the challenges in galvanizing political will, as well as resources to dedicate to the business and human rights agenda. I hear from companies the challenges involved in leveling the playing field and achieving board leadership on these issues. And of course, from civil society, we are repeatedly reminded how it's just not good enough for us, for us to have nice policies on paper, because what we really need is implementation. These common constraints collectively render multi-stakeholder alliances all the more important to pushing forward the business and human rights agenda in this region. But to fully harness this particular lever of change, um, it is important that we need to ensure that these alliances are centered on and informed by the rights and the needs of rights holders, whether these be communities affected by or vulnerable to business-related human rights violations, civil society more broadly, or consumers. Not only are they on the receiving end of business-related human rights impacts, but their lived experiences and their presence on the ground are value-added when it comes to adding depth and nuance to the localized implementation of the UN guiding principles. And because collective action is an essential part of any solution to the systemic challenges at the root of many business-related human rights impacts, these alliances must also be part of a broader global push towards mandatory human rights due diligence and domestic legislation. Accomplishing this is nevertheless easier said than done. And trust building is central to this enterprise, as is the concept of responsibility, not burden, sharing, um, amongst all of the stakeholders involved. And so while collective action stands to strengthen the implementation of the guiding principles and its values, the UNGPs make clear still that joining multi-stakeholder alliances alone do not diminish or replace states' duty to protect human rights, nor businesses' responsibility to respect human rights. Accordingly, we need to see human rights considerations integrated into all policy-making processes as well as business operations. The co-organizers of the forum received yesterday a joint open letter from a diverse group of civil society organizations and non-governmental organizations urging the Thai government to enhance action on the protection of human rights defenders from judicial harassment and slap actions. We acknowledge the important concerns raised in that letter. At the same time, it's important to point out that the concerns with respect to the protection of human rights defenders raised in that letter also apply to other parts of this region. With states in this region taking action as well as an active interest in developing national action plans on business and human rights, and this is a trend that ought to be encouraged and supported as much as possible, we are still reminded that these national action plans must be treated as living documents that reflect inclusive public participation. And for there to be free prior and informed consent, it is imperative that the persecution and criminalization of human rights defenders stop and that the contributions of human rights defenders to advancing business and human rights be recognized and celebrated. So let's celebrate rights holders as a major lever of change. And let's put rights holders at the center now. I'll stop there, but thank you again for this opportunity. Thank you, thank you, Pichimone. What, what, a, what a great, uh, what a great uh, closure, closure on, on, on the, uh, celebrating the rights holders and putting them at the center. It's a bit of the fil rouge of all the points that you made uh, uh, eventually, all, all um, point to the importance of putting rights holders at the center. We, we actually did hear many points uh, raised from mandatory human rights to diligence to alliances to collective action, including public participation. Indeed, free 
prior and informed consent, something not mentioned uh, often enough, and I'm sure we'll hear more from Joyce later about the free prior and informed um, consent. All the points you have made, in fact, or most of them, will be unpacked in specific sessions of the, of the forum, which was built around all these uh, levers of change. Now, uh, Dr. Pichamon, one thing you haven't referenced in, in this particular intervention, but you did in, in the keynote speech, uh, was a reference to the adoption of, of the Human Rights Council and UNGA Assembly um, twin resolutions uh, on the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. It was mentioned also by more than one keynote speaker, in fact. It's a landmark moment that allows for an even more explicit connection, or in fact, uh, I would call, uh, allows us for an integration of the environmental and the human rights agendas, including in the context of business operation. So we are very thankful uh, in this regard to the main advocate for those twin resolutions, the Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and the Environment, Mr. Dave Boyd, for having provided a video message with some of his reflections on the matter. So I'm kindly asking the technical team to please screen the message that was sent to us by Mr. Boyd. Hello from Canada. I'm Dr. David Boyd, the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and the Environment. And I'm honored to be participating in this Asia Pacific Forum on Responsible Businesses and Human Rights. Ladies and gentlemen, on 28th of July, earlier this year, the United Nations General Assembly adopted a resolution recognizing for the first time that everyone everywhere has the right to live in a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. This resolution enjoyed the support of countries from throughout the Asia Pacific region, as well as leading businesses from across the world. The right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment includes clean air, safe and sufficient water, healthy and sustainably produced food, healthy ecosystems and biodiversity, non-toxic environments where people can live, work, learn, and play, and of course, a safe, livable climate. The right to a healthy environment also includes a toolkit for communities and citizens to pursue their right, including access to environmental information, participation in environmental decision-making, and access to justice where their rights are being threatened or violated. We know that UN resolutions of this nature are catalysts for accelerated actions. Take, for example, the 2010 resolution on the right to water, which has since been translated into constitutions, legislation, and most importantly, accelerated action to fulfill the right. So countries as diverse as Costa Rica, Fiji, Mexico, Slovenia, and Tunisia added the right to water to their constitutions and then have taken actions to fulfill that right, such as Mexico's program to bring safe drinking water to more than 1,000 rural communities in the past 10 years. When it comes to achieving the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and fulfilling the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment, businesses have a vital role to play. They must be part of the solution. And there are trillions of dollars of economic opportunities created by actions to protect the environment and the climate in the field of renewable energy, energy efficiency, in the transition to a circular economy where everything we make and use can be recycled, reused, and composted. Everything from solar panels to electric bicycles. The future is here, the technologies exist, but governments must take the steps to fulfill their obligations and to ensure that businesses fulfill their responsibilities. I look forward to working with businesses and governments to make the right to a healthy environment a reality for everyone in the Asia Pacific. Thank you very much. Well, inspiring messages indeed from, from Mr. Boyd. We'll, I'm told we'll be watching the recording of this session, so I, I do take the opportunity of thanking him for his contribution when he will watch us. Now, let's stay on the connection on business, human rights, and the environment as I turn to the next uh, speaker, um, Ambassador Grondhal. Ambassador, 
I would like to, to build on the messages that we have just heard from Mr. Boyd on the importance of the recognition from the UN uh, General Assembly recently and a little bit earlier from the Human Rights Council that environmental rights are human rights. It's something that many of us uh, uh, already felt was the case, but this is an important recognition that again makes it more explicit. The government of Sweden uh, has been long uh, long, long promoting uh, uh, an integrated approach to responsibilities towards people and the planet, including in the strategy that um, the government of Sweden has in support of, of Asia. What are your views on how we can leverage our work on business and human rights to support environmental protection in Asia? and encourage a greater use of human rights-based approach, right? so the other side of the story, among those working on preserving our precious uh, planet, our precious environment. The floor is yours, Ambassador. Thank you so much, uh, dear Livio. Uh, dear co-panelists, uh, distinguished participants, uh, very good morning to all of you. Um, Delighted at this opportunity to be here today uh, to say a few words on a subject that is very dear to my government and also to, to myself personally. I'm particularly pleased to see so many of our UN partners coming together again uh, to hold this important event. Let me first state uh, the obvious. Um, the world today faces multiple environmental challenges, as we all know. Climate change, uh, biodiversity loss, uh, pollution, uh, just to mention a few. Uh, the environmental and climate emergencies facing the Earth are, in its essence, transboundary, and thereby also, of course, affects us all. At the same time, democratic development and the respect for human rights and the rule of law around the world are under attack. And on the rise, we continue to find authoritarianism, misogynism, chauvinism, populism, and so on. Space for media and the civil society to operate freely has shrunken markedly. So we have to acknowledge both that there is inequality crisis, environmental crisis, uh, and also a democracy crisis. And by the way, 20 plus years ago, who would have thought that? 20 plus years ago when everything seemed possible, at least that what it felt like being a, a young diplomat. I think it's a very, very sad development. Okay, so the links between environmentally and climate resilient sustainable development and human rights, democracy and the rule of law in the region are clear, especially for people in vulnerable situations and people living in poverty. Recent floodings again support this statement, I think. The vulnerable are, as always, hit the hardest, uh, with no sufficient social protection and effective remedy in place. Pressing issues such as attacks on human rights defenders and environmental human rights defenders are also observed in this region. Human rights defenders are at the front line in the struggle for a better future. But they face increasing resistance for mobilizing to protect the environment and confront climate change, and for speaking out to address the adverse human rights impacts of business operation. For instance, Strategic lawsuits against public participation, or SLAP, are increasingly used by companies to silence those who voice their concerns. I'm a lawyer by training, and in my view, this is a clear abuse of the legal system. Despite several progresses uh, made concerning the business and human rights in the region, for example, adoption of uh, national action plans, or NAPs, in Thailand, Japan, and Pakistan, uh, and a few that are in the pipeline, uh, such as Indonesia and Vietnam, there is still a contrast between the progress at the top and the reality on the ground when we talk about business and human rights. We have to go from words to action. Implementation is key. And let us be honest, a lot of work remains to be done. So, can Sweden be a source of inspiration? Uh, well, I like to think that, uh, and I wouldn't be a Swedish ambassador if I didn't, I guess. Uh, 
Uh, we have a clear focus uh, in our foreign policy to promote inclusive, sustainable, and responsible businesses. We are certain that the successful and competitive companies of the future are those that make human rights and environmental, social, and governance due diligence part of their core business. The Swedish green model means integrating business and sustainability. Sweden has emphasized that green growth can and should drive transition through technical innovation rather than pose a risk. This involves adapting society to cope with environmental changes already underway. Over the years, the Swedish government and private sector have continuously joined efforts to demonstrate good examples of responsible and sustainable businesses in Sweden and abroad. Swedish companies are strongly encouraged to use international guidelines as basis for their operations to integrate aspects of human rights, gender equality and environment into their core values. In this region, the work on business and human rights has opened the spaces for stakeholders to work together in the development and implementation of several national action plans, as you all know. We believe keeping these spaces as inclusive and participatory as possible crucial. The right to meaningful participation in public consultation is also an important human rights principle and one that is at the core of the 2030 agenda. In Asia, sometimes CSOs are perceived as anti-business and anti-development and one of the lessons learned from my country, Sweden, is that collaboration is the key to change. Swedish businesses is making more and more collaboration with diverse actors, in particular academia and civil society. And at the end of that line, they are also becoming more profitable. Collaboration requires, of course, trust. And relationship building is key. And such a forum like this is an important platform and space for mutual learning and understanding. Sweden is proud to support uh, our development partners working in this area. The integrated approach between environment and human rights is also key in the new regional development cooperation strategy for Asia Pacific and protection of environmental human rights defenders is a clear priority in the Swedish government's drive for democracy. My colleague, uh, Mrs. Anna Maria Ultorp, head of our development section at the embassy, will join an important session later today and share how states and international communities can better protect and support environmental human rights defenders. I think it's fair to say that we need to be much better in publicly recognizing the positive contribution from environmental human rights defenders to a sustainable development. They are the eyes and ears on the ground. They are the ones that often experience firsthand what is happening with the environment and the impact on the lives of indigenous people and local communities. We must do all we can to support environmental human rights defenders and improve their protection and their possibilities to access justice. Finally, the way forward. Um, to build back better, we firmly believe that human rights and environmental rights are inseparable and mutually reinforcing. Sustainable solutions to key challenges can best be reached only through an integrated approach, such as having a clear focus and priority on human rights and environment in parallel with work on businesses and economic development. This integration of the economic, social and environmental dimensions of sustainability is key to achieving sustainable development and leaving no one behind. We will continue to build broad partnerships uh, with a wide range of relevant and strategic actors, continue to support CSOs in a flexible manner, explore ways to reach marginalized grassroots organizations and build capacity on the ground. In short, you can trust on Sweden. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you, Thank you for, for your very kind words with regards to the joint one UN work of which we are indeed very proud. In turn, I, I feel I definitely express the feelings of also my colleagues of the other agencies in thanking the government of Sweden and indeed some other development partners that are supporting us in, in, in the projects that uh, all of us are implementing uh, in support of responsible business practices. Thank you for your reference again to human rights defenders, to environmental human rights defenders. Thank you also for pointing to what I believe your predecessor was always calling the proof of the pudding, which is in the remedies, access to remedies. 
Indeed, the defenders are there at the center. Indeed, the defenders are those who know the most. Indeed, they are a resource for businesses. But the fact of the matter is that they are being abused. So unless uh, we all collectively find a way to prevent abuses to take place and uh, provide access remedies where, um, when, when abuses do take place, uh, the, uh, the, the, the picture will remain, unfortunately, dark. Now, let me turn to um, the next speaker, who is uh, Kunarilak Pachayapum. Uh, Narilak, um, if we look at the business and human rights discourse, uh, you and I have been working together on this for quite a few years here in Thailand. If we look at this global, at the discourse here in Thailand, but also globally, especially um, in the last two years, and we look at the role of governments, we see an obvious progression from the adoption of policies such as national action plans on business and human rights to a hardening of norms on business respect for human rights, which in some cases that most of those present here are aware, for example, in Europe, have already translated into the adoption of mandatory legislation on human rights due diligence. And, and again, most of us know that more of such norms will be coming soon. Now, Thailand was the first country in Asia to adopt an, an app. Um, and it's now in the process, in fact, of adopting its second app, right? I, I think it will be adopted uh, by, the end of, uh, by the end of this year. I'd like your reflections on the advantages and limits of, of non-binding non -binding norms, uh, such as those obviously contained in NAP and another type of non-binding policies adopted elsewhere. Do you agree with those who believe that the only effective lever of change that we can get from governments come from mandatory requirements. The floor is yours, Narilak. Thank you very much, Livio. And first of all, I'd like to thank the organizer, the UN agencies, to organize this event and also uh, invite Thailand to be part of this panel. And also, I'm glad to see um, a lot of familiar faces here in the friends from the region and also I'm very delighted to join the panel with all the distinguished panelists. Um, in Thailand, as everyone aware that we um, launched the NAP since 2019, and if you see Thai NAPs, um, Thai NAPs is, um, is a mix between a kind of obligation for the states and also voluntary measures for the government. Um, uh, if you see the, the government's section in the NAP, in Thailand, we, there will be a, a comprise of the list of activities, indication of the indicate the responsible agency, time frame and indicator, and also linkage between the national strategies, um, UNGPs, and also the SDGs. But for the uh, business section in the NAP, it will only um, indicate the minimum expectation of the government towards the business. So. From what we have implemented the, the NAP for almost four years, we found we, we have already done the kind of the review and evaluation of the progress of the implementation of the NAP. And we have found that for the government side, it is, um, of course, it's an obligation for the state. It's kind of the mandatory for the states. So 100% of the um, government agency indicate in the NAP has report the, the, the result of the implementation to our office. And, and as of uh, so far, 130 activities out of 142 activities has achieved accord, according to the NAP, and it's equal to about 91.55%. Um, and uh, we found that uh, for the government, uh, because it's the, um, it's the obligation and it's the mandatory for the government, it is not uh, difficult for us to follow up and also there is a requirement in the NAP that every agency has to report back to the ministry at the end of every year and it has to report to the cabinet. So this is the duty to report the result of implementation to the, to the cabinet at the end of every year. So to minister, for the Ministry of Justice, it is, it is not very challenging in follow up about the re this result and also to gather information from the government side. But the challenging is very much in for the 
uh, we have a very quite challenging in the business sectors because in the business sector is a voluntary measures. Um, we are lucky that Security and Exchange Commission of Thailand take leads in, this, in, in, in the business sector that uh, they are launching, adopt the, launching the, um, the regulation uh, re to require all listed company to uh, disclose information, uh, especially related to the ESG. So it's, it's, like a, it's not the mandatory human rights due diligence yet, but it is a mandatory disclosure of information related to ESG for the listed company. But we still have a challenging on small and medium-sized company because majority of the business sector in Thailand is a SMEs. So we have a very challenging in encouraging them in working on uh, in implementing NAP. Of course, we have because they have um, different level of knowledge on, on human rights. They have different resources, different nature of their business, and also different um, interests or will to, to implement the NAP. So um, what we do is that we try to um, encourage them through many activity. For example, we um, sign MOU with the SME Federation of Thailand and Industrial Association of Thailand. We bring the team to talk with the Chamber of Commerce, Industrial Association, Bank Association, SME Federation, and also we um, provide a series of training throughout the year and provide them with uh, quite a, a lot of uh, media that we are developed for to, to build up the, the knowledge and increase the awareness on business. So I found that to me, to, to answer to your question, I think the mandatory measure is good, but for the business, voluntary measure is also good, but it's good at the beginning. So we need to move a little bit uh, like step by step to the mandatory measure. If we, as a government, we adopt you know, like immediately adopt the mandatory measure, we may get like, we may receive the, um, a negative feedback or pushback by the business. So I think we need to move um, um, gradually, like uh, um, em embed the knowledge on human rights with, them, with the business sector and try to make them understand. And voluntary measure is good at the start, at the, in initial, at the initial stage. But we, are, we think that to ensure the better implementation, perhaps the mandatory measure is, a, is the answer at, at, at the end. But of, of course, as I mentioned, we need to embed the knowledge on, on UNGPs and also human rights and also make them understand about the, the benefit of the, of the responsible business conduct. And if they really understand it, we will get the collaboration from them and also uh, we can build up the um, responsible business conduct in a more sustainable manner. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for not a lot. Thank you. Thank you for being uh, very honest about the challenges, as, as you always are. I always appreciate you having in panels, because you, you're always very honest about the challenges that uh, you are facing. Thank you for mentioning the importance of incentives when bringing in uh, voluntary norms. And, and thank you for pointing to the fact that uh, the responsible business discourse ardens somehow in increments. This is what we have seen happening in Europe, and this is what probably will be seeing happening in Asia as well. I'm, uh, I hope I don't disclose anything secret, uh, because UNDP is helping the government of Thailand. is also doing some initial research about uh, uh, possibly introducing at some point mandatory uh, human rights norms here in Thailand. So the trajectory is clear, and indeed the work done by the Security and Exchange Commissions goes in that same direction. By the way, for those interested in knowing more about the Security and Exchange Commission uh, um, uh, uh, norms coming up, uh, the session on, on day three, the opening session, which will reflect on developments uh, in, in, in Japan, will also include the presence of the Secretary General of the Security and Exchange Commission, which will talk more about this uh, regulation. So thank you again, uh, Nariluk. And I'd like to turn now to Professor Tomoya Obokata. And, and I would like to stay on, on the discussion around norms and building on the conversation we just had with Kunarilak. I would like you to reflect on the level of success so far 
of pieces of legislation and, and other norms adopted with the specific uh, purpose of curbing the plague of forced labor, of which um, you are an expert. And now, a, a most recent of this initiative actually came out, came out uh, if I'm not wrong, two days ago from the EU Commission that adopted uh, a proposal to ban products made with forced labor in the EU. It still needs to be uh, embraced by the parliament, uh, and, and, uh, but it, it's, a, it's a very strong proposal, which again mirrors similar norms that have already been adopted in other parts of the world. In your recent report to the Human Rights Council, uh, which took place in a few days ago, again, I believe on 15 of, of, of uh, September, you list these acts as positive developments. You include them in what we would call your levers of change. Um, now, in this region, the only dedicated uh, modern slavery act is the Australian Act, which is actually being reviewed. But given the globalized nature of supply chains, other acts and norms adopted outside this continent are also influencing practices of, of businesses in Asia. To which extent, Professor, modern slavery acts are levels of change. Uh, are they working? What is missing? I'd like to hear your reflections. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you very much uh, for that. And uh, thank you to the organizers for inviting me uh, to this uh, forum. Now, the protection of human rights in the field of business is extremely important to my mandate as millions of people are exploited in a number of economic sectors, both in a formal and informal economy. Now, just last week, the ILO, Walk Free, and IOM released a global estimate saying that the 50 million people are held in modern slavery on any given day. And of these, close to 30 million are in Asia and Pacific, and this serves as a wake-up call, in my view. I look forward to engaging with you in the next few days to exchange views and good practice in a spirit of mutual sharing and learning. So please feel free to approach me at uh, any time. And to answer your question, yes, uh, modern slavery laws uh, have been serving as a lever of change in terms of preventing modern slavery and promoting human rights due diligence. But it is also clear that more needs to be done to enforce them effectively. Now, first and foremost, uh, modern slavery legislation represents a criminal law response. And now, and all, almost all member states prohibit modern slavery one way or another with appropriate criminal sanctions, which is a positive development compared to, for example, 10, 20 years ago, where there's a fra fragmented approach in a criminal justice response responses. But having said this, criminal law applies to natural persons. Here you're talking about individual criminals or organized criminal groups, but not to employers or businesses. In other words, uh, corporate criminal liability for modern slavery has not been clearly established globally, although it applies to offenses such as corruption, bribery, and, and so on. And this raises a question as to whether we need to do more in, re, uh, in this regard to secure corporate liability. Now, in terms of the second aspect, modern slavery laws undoubtedly have been acting as an important catalyst for promoting human rights due diligence. Now, there's a different approach to this. The first is a, a, a soft approach where there's no mandatory uh, human rights due diligence as represented, for example, by the United Kingdom's Modern Slavery Act 2015, as well as Australia's Modern Slavery Act 2018. These uh, piece, pieces of legislation mainly impose reporting obligations without hard uh, uh, sanctions in case of breaches. So that, one of the critiques then there is that, okay, it's just a, a stamping or tick box exercise, companies just filling out you know, using the same template every year, just, you know, and signing it. So what is the point of it if you can't enforce it? So I think there's a, an issue with a soft, soft approach. And now there's a hard approach, as uh, mentioned by uh, uh, our colleagues, of mandatory uh, human rights due diligence. Now, as you might be aware already, this is quite becoming stronger in Europe. Uh, so I can mention a few countries, France, Norway, Germany, the Netherlands, Switzerland, and among others, have implemented legislation imposing obligation on businesses to report and address it further than that, do something about it, make an action plan and implement it. And if, if failure to do so will result in sanctions, civil uh, sanctions at least, fines 
and other measures. And most recently in the United States, we got Forced Labor Pre Prevention Act, which prohibits uh, in, you know, importation of goods produced as a result of forced labor. Uh, now, uh, as mentioned, that, that is being considered by European Union. Whether that is a good thing or bad thing, I mean, from the business point of view, is open to question, and I'm very happy to have that conversation. But there are a few uh, issues there. First of all, again, as highlighted, uh, EU directive, if implemented, only applies to 1% of all companies registered in that territory. So that means 99%. You know, it's, it's, it, it doesn't apply because it only applies to big companies. And so the problem then becomes small and medium enterprises. What happens to them? They have no obligations. And this is particularly so in Asia where the majority of the businesses are operating in an informal economy, which it demonstrates uh, clear indicators of forced labor as well as decent work deficit. I think this is an important point. I know that there's a session on informal economy. I, I certainly will be attending that next few days. And enforcement is also an issue because, okay, laws are good in principle, but how do you enforce it? And it is practically impossible to knock on every single business, farms and factories and, and, and restaurants and so on, to knock on each door and uh, inspecting uh, labor, uh, uh, le conduct labor inspections. So I think that, that there is also issue in terms of enforcement. Um, so now looking into the future then, I think legislations are important, but now you know, businesses and governments are increasingly looking into use of technologies such as blockchain technology, which is maybe some of you may know in, in terms of cryptocurrency and so on, where it tracks down all the transactions, record it. You can't, you know, uh, change it and use intel uh, artificial intelligence again to monitor the movements of goods, services, even people. So, in my view, in addition to legislation or, or the soft approach of guide guidelines, and I think there may be a need to look farther than that and kind of consider these modern technologies to prevent and suppress modern slavery. So I'll stop there, and I very much look forward to meeting you at uh, later stage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. <laughs> Thank you for, for pointing to some of uh, some, some uh, thematic points which are, I can see, recurring in the presentations of all the speakers here. Certainly, the challenge of MSMEs and, and the informal uh, economy. But also, thank you for pointing to a, to a new level of change which we hadn't heard about today, uh, the, the use of, of uh, technology the use of technology alongside uh, uh, the hardening of norms, where you also pointed to a progression in that sense. But you also warned us that even the, the mandatory um, human rights due diligence that everyone is, is uh, very excited about and uh, with reasons will, will uh, certainly uh, not be a panacea, will certainly not uh, result in, in, in immediate massive changes. It will be one of the levers of change available uh, to us. Um, let me turn to uh, my left side and, and ask uh, Marie Joyce Godillo to uh, take the floor. Uh, Ms. Joyce, uh, you have attended yesterday, I must say, a very well attended uh, closed door session, which this forum uh, organizes every year with a civil society organization, a space for them to um, discuss among them and indeed to meet, uh, in, in yesterday's case, with uh, special uh, procedures and, and have a dialogue with them. Um, and in this, this group discussions, many challenges uh, were um, highlighted and, 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 and some also opportunities to overcome these challenges were pointed to. I would like you to bring into this discussion your reflections specifically on challenges faced by indigenous peoples. Uh, in particular, uh, indigenous people as, as they relate to business operation. And perhaps if you can also point to um, some opportunities to overcome this, these challenges uh, in your view. So what are the levels of change that the rights holders and their defenders see as most promising? Ms. Joyce, you have the floor. Thank you. First of all, um, thank you very much for providing this opportunity to um, speak and be part of um, the panel. Yes, um, so for the CSO, um, I would narrow down on indigenous people. So for yesterday's who were not able to attend the CSO safe space, um, we have indigenous peoples from um, across um, Asia. We have from uh, representatives from Cambodia, Thailand, from North and the South, the Philippines, Indonesia, Nepal, Bangladesh, and India. Um, 
in the interest of time, like the common issues that indigenous peoples across this country and even those that are um, not able to be present here in person is the issue of access to justice. And we have meant, and this, um, we appreciate the recognition as, as, as the panelists have also mentioned, like this are the gaps or this is one of the gaps that um, indigenous peoples and CSOs, human rights defenders um, that are working on the ground have faced. Mostly um, national justice system does not work um, or fails to protect um, their human rights and protect our collective rights on self-determination and land, um, which of course is, is a bulk of uh, the rights of indigenous peoples. And um, also the repressive government or the lack um, which you can link to the abuse of the use of law, criminalization of indigenous peoples, of land rights defenders um, and human rights defenders in general. Um, and also the security laws that are used that are heightened during the COVID, um, um, during the COVID pandemic where quarantine legislations or quarantine policies are also used to repress to more to repress um, the voices of, uh, leg legitimate voices of um, human rights defenders. Um, for the levers of change, um, and I think I would li link that to that, is um, a more responsive national legislations uh, and actually making, I think there's um, a common theme was a frustration of actually making uh, governments and corporations accountable. Corporations of any form, transnational or may be small and medium um, enterprises. And uh, we welcome uh, the, from, from the speaker, from the government of, of, of Thailand, of course, uh, to the Minister of Justice um, here uh, about the recognition um, of land rights and indigenous people's rights. And I think, uh, but with uh, the response from yesterday is that NAP, has failed to protect indigenous peoples and other marginalized communities here in Thailand. The voluntary framework uh, for within the context of business and human rights, including the UNGPs, although they are very significant and crucial instruments, but they have provided a space that had continued and even increased the human rights violations of corporations and failed to make them accountable. And I don't think uh, this is a matter of the, the size of the corporation. Of course, the size um, and the influence matter, but then the perspective should not be on how big these corporations are or how small they operate. The perspective is on the human rights violations that these corporations, that these companies are actually doing regardless of um, their reach or um, their extent of, um, of influence, as in the case of transnational corporations. So I think there should be that, uh, that should be the focus, uh, the protection of human rights um, in general, and of course, collective rights of indigenous peoples on land and self-determination. Um, it was mentioned earlier, the free prior informed consent. There's a lot of, um, for lack of a better word, it's like misunderstanding of FPIC. FPIC, collective rights of FPIC, is almost watered down, it's always watered down with consultation in general, where it is done one time, and then the, the, once the permit is given, uh, or a, gov uh, a corporation gets a permit, then they can operate. FPIC is a continuing process. It is tied to our collective rights to self-determination and land, and I will not, um, maybe this is not the space to elaborate on that, but I hope there is a distinction that uh, collective rights of FPIC is tied to indigenous people's um, rights and consultation, of course, um, and uh, um, inclusion um, is a right for everyone. And I think there's also a need, and this was mentioned earlier, of the importance of political will of, of governments. Uh, we are seeing authoritarian governments, as in the case in the Philippines, um, and in other countries in Asia and around the world, where repressive governments are, are on the rise. And um, the importance of governments to actually realize that the protection of rights within the context of business and human rights includes them and not just, a, and not just the corporations that are responsible in protecting the rights of um, people that they work with and of course indigenous peoples in general. So I think um, a multi-dimensional approach, um, I understand the importance of uh, a, binding, a binding instrument and a mandatory um, 
instrument at the national level and at various levels where they are significant. At regional, we're seeing them in the EU. Um, maybe in ASEAN, that's something that you can wish for, but also a, a global um, binding instrument. But again, this is not different from the already existing binding instruments that we have, but still we have them, they have been ratified, but violations still continue to happen. So we want to ask, is this, is this just a matter of a binding instrument at mandatory at whatever levels where they are significant, or is this a need for a system change um, where corporations and governments are actually made accountable and a difference of perspective where you actually put human rights and people at the center more than profit. And I think um, with, the COVID, with COVID that had happened to us and now it's going back to normal and it's getting worse. So I think there's, there's, it's a challenge for, for us, um, us CSOs, but I think you can count on CSOs to continue their work on the ground despite the frustrations, despite the pockets of success. We want success that is actually reflective on the ground. We've recognized that, that after all these years, for those that are working here for decades, have gotten old and with their, um, have aged and um, become senior in their positions, but the problems still remain, why? So I think there's, um, uh, for the UN system, for the government um, to actually also see the issue from, from the ground. Join us from the ground. I think that's also a collective call from, um, from the space yesterday. And see it how we see it. Feel it how, how it is being felt on the ground. And maybe that could, that, that's the change that we needed to, um, to understand and actually provide a, a, more, a more sustainable and systemic change. We shouldn't be comfortable. We should shake the system that have made us comfortable all these years. So yeah, I think I'll stop there. Thank you, Joyce. Uh, shake the system, system change. At the end, there is a convergence between all the points made today by many that that is what is needed. Uh, and what uh, we see a certain trajectory, but we see it still too distant. And perhaps a combination of all these levers of change that were mentioned today will eventually lead to that system change that you were referring to. Now, let me give the floor to the last speaker before we, we hopefully uh, take some questions from the floor. So start thinking about questions you might want to pose to our speakers. I'd like to give the floor to uh, Shunsmita Anis. Um, Ms. Shunsmita, um, a closed door space conversation, in fact, uh, happened yesterday also uh, among business actors. Uh, what is the perspective of employers and, and yours? personally, on the pace of change in terms of reducing abuse, abuses that is considered, and, and we, have, we have heard it many times already today, is considered too slow. And, and, and what, is, what are your reflections on the scale of it, which uh, some analysts indeed consider too small? The good practices and uh, uh, the, the, the examples of so-called champions are certainly growing. We're testimony of that. There are, there are, more and more good practices and, 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 and champions. Uh, but also the reports on abuses seems to remain very high in numbers and, and, and in certain contexts, in fact, even growing. What are, in your view, those levers that can help us all collectively, as many were saying, in changing gear and go from evidence of progress, to which I was referring at the beginning, to more diffuse normalization uh, of responsible business practices in Asia. The floor is yours, um, Shumsita. Respected guests, respected panelists, and ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Bangladesh Employers Federation, we thank you for inviting us to this event. Responsible business and human rights are very important for society and businesses. It is an integral part of society. So business and human rights uh, in a wider aspect, the respect, democracy, and good governance, these are the three main components. In order to achieve Bangladesh's national goal, the government, industry, and all stakeholders need to continue to collaborate through meaningful consultation, prioritize issues, midterm, long-term, and short-term, 
in a cohesive manner in the framework to take us forward. I must acknowledge the International Organization of Employers, IOE. Our Umbrella Federation in Geneva has played a vibrant role in promoting human rights across member federations. They have provided us with all possible guidance and technical assistance and support in promoting business and human rights. Bangladesh Employers Federation also gets the required advocacy and cooperation from IOE on business and human rights related issues. BEF can enhance knowledge base and learn from sharing best practices through IOE. In terms of progress, as you've mentioned, I would like to uh, mention a few things that has happened and um, then I'll discuss the challenges. I'm happy to share that our government of Bangladesh has worked very hard on human rights and recently it has ratified the ILO Convention number 138, minimum age, and ILO Protocol number 29, forced and compulsory labor. Unemployment insurance is also being incorporated into our national security scheme. So Bangladesh government is working on a national ac action plan on labor sector for Bangladesh 2021-2026 through the consultative process. These moves reiterate its commitment towards human rights due diligence and reinforce the country's positive image in the global community. Yes, um, there are many challenges during COVID-19. Uh, it has impacted the world. The government gave many incentive packages where BEF gave input and the government gave about $12 billion, half a million in micro and small enterprises, half a million on salary and subsidies. A lot of activities have happened in collaboration with the workers, employers, and governments, and no one in Bangladesh was unfed. BEF coordinated many CSR activities, and we are developing that ecosystem. We're still in the process. BEF did a lot of awareness training and modules, different modules, with the help of World Bank on business conduct in all aspects of business. So the challenges are, um, this is where we need to improve on. See, 90% of the worker workforce are informal sectors, and it is very challenging when the government officials in different sectors and secretariat's officials change very frequently. So Bangladesh Employers Federation is passionate and continuing to have a solid, uh, constant uh, driving force to work with the government and the workers and uh, to have this continuous dialogue so that the, uh, that continuity continue as we face all these challenges one of the most uh, important thing to have this coherent policy across all bodies. In terms of business, one, I would say, fundamental improvement in the government sector, as I lead a conglomerate, is that uh, you know environmental policies are enforced increasingly every year. There's more and more uh, accountability from large corporations. But when it comes to small and medium, this is where the real challenge happens. And like um, our other respected panelists have mentioned, it is very, very important to actually see the ground and the challenges for those small and medium enterprises and how we can take them and understand their issues and make practical, doable, implementable action plan and incorporate in the NAP. I mean, this is where we need to work on, and BEF is being the center um, connector for the government, the workers, and the tripartite system. One more challenge uh, we find that uh, in the informal sector, because of the um, price, you know, everything at the end of the day with the COVID and the macroeconomic environment, there's a lot of challenge across the small, medium, and large corporations in terms of the inflation and all its impact. So although, I mean, we have to take 
uh, every step will have an impact on our, in terms of expense and cost, but we have to continuously make people and the business community aware that these costs are actually not costs, but these are competitive advantages to take all the steps to, uh, to actually compete in the global world. Raising awareness this, um, through the focus, building capacity, trade unions, using uh, all the agencies, government, academia, and proactively working on all the aspects will help us help uh, enhance um, our overall implication and you know how we can implement. It's the quality of implementation that has to improve. Undoubtedly, we have to bring positive changes in our way of doing business. Nation will have to endure a transition period before all the changes can surface. We will only commit to have patience after sowing the seeds of responsibility at all levels. I'm confident that with the joint global effort, we can go a long way in achieving the goal. And in order to achieve the goal, all of us, all stakeholders have to be together in the same pace, in an accelerated pace to take it forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shumsita, also for, for, for your honesty in, in pointing to the challenges faced. Uh, uh, we'll welcome, of course, the policy moves that you refer to happening uh, in, in Bangladesh. Uh, thank you for pointing to the two sides of the, the story of the challenges with uh, small and medium, and, and medium uh, and enterprises, and indeed for pointing to the competitive advantage that companies uh, have in also doing the right thing. Shumsita was the last speaker. Uh, we're coming pretty much to, on, on, on time to the end of the session, but I take the liberty of suggesting that we use 10 minutes of a relatively large coffee break that we have set up. It was 30 minutes. Let's take 10 minutes to see if there are brief questions or comments from the floor. I'll take two, maybe three, if the comments and questions are very, very short. And then give the floor back to those to whom you, you, uh, you ask the question for. So if I can see hands up for anybody that wants to make a comment or ask a question. OK, I do see one question there, two questions, and third, OK? So one, two, and three. Please be very brief. Introduce yourself. And again, if it is a question, um, say to whom these questions is directed, please. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Livio. Uh, my name is Florian Berenek. I'm today here from Vietnam, representing the Central Eastern European Chamber of Commerce uh, and Industry in Vietnam, so in a business role today. And uh, I would like just to raise one point, uh, which uh, was brought up by, uh, by uh, Professor Obokata. Uh, you were saying uh, that uh, in Europe, all this new legislation is reaching out just to a small part of companies, yeah, just the big ones and so on, and all the small ones are maybe left out. And I'm uh, representing uh, today here a lot of companies, smaller companies from seven European countries, Eastern European countries. I have to tell you that especially the smaller ones are those who really care about this today without any legislation. And these smaller ones, they have to be protected from the big ones. The big ones who are ruining the prices by just ignoring, just uh, not following all the regulations, all the human rights claims uh, they are making on the paper. And the small European businesses are really suffering from that. And I think this is very important to recognize, not to highlight all oh, just the big names, oh, they do this to that. They don't. The small ones are the ones. They are family businesses. They reach out to family businesses in Vietnam, in the region, and they try to establish good networks. And I really, really would love to see over the next days that we highlight the role of also the small business businesses in Europe, in the Western countries. They are really good ones. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. It was more of a comment than a question, but I will <laughs> give uh, the floor back to, to the professor to perhaps comment on your comment. There was one more question down there. Yes, please. Hello, Namaste. This is Durga Rai from Nepal, and uh, I'm an indigenous rights activist. So my question is, 
Her Excellency from the Sweden Ambassador. Nepal, uh, the European Bank is making big investment in the power development sectors. So transmission line, hydropower sectors in this area, they are making big in investment. And most of the projects are operating in the territories of indigenous peoples. So gradually, these projects are getting into conflict because they are not respecting the right of indigenous peoples to act big. So I want to know that if the Sweden government have any role to make bank accountable towards indigenous right. Thank you. OK, thank you for the questions. Uh, I'll, I'll let the ambassador come in on this question. There was a third one that I saw down there. Yes, please. Thank you. I'm Arthi Kapoor from Embode. I was very interested to hear um, the comments about small and medium enterprises. And Kun Pichanon, you were talking about the global cooperation and stakeholder engagement needs to be better. And um, Kun um, Narilak, you were talking about mandatory human rights due diligence legislation may be too premature for Thailand. And um, Sushmita's comment on employers that need to be supported step by step, especially small and medium enterprises. Now, I'm thinking about supply chains, particularly supply chain actors in Asia, such as Thailand, um, Malaysia, Indonesia. Where, with the European mandatory human rights due diligence, these supply chain actors that are um, uh, uh, you know, um, exporting to the EU and the global north, they are under more and more pressure to implement um, due diligence requirements that are set in the EU but they're receiving um, very little support in uh, complying with the increasing number of audits and the increasing number of due diligence requirements, which are sometimes not fit for purpose in Asia. So um, some comments on that would be wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the question. So I do believe we have uh, maybe one minute uh, uh, each for, uh, for uh, a remark on the basis of the comments and questions that were posed. I will start with uh, Professor Tomoya. Well, thank you very much. I think that your points about the small medium enterprises are uh, excellent ones, and I do agree that they need to be protected, uh, certainly. And I also uh, understand that some of the, you know, the trickle-down effect of all this due diligence requirement on the ground of small medium companies that the real. And I, I do agree, and the money support needs to be provided in that regard. And I'll be, I'll be very happy to work with relevant stakeholders to promote that type of culture with, uh, at, at different levels. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. I believe the, the question was then posed to, to Ambassador Grondahl, please. Thank you so much, and thank you for the question. Um, I have not been following Nepal at all, and I'm not aware of European or Swedish banks making investments in Nepal in areas with indigenous population. So I'm afraid I have to disappoint you, maybe, uh, and, but I will be more than willing to pass, pass it on to, to uh, our embassy in Delhi, uh, which is also covering Nepal, but also to look into the matter, because this is completely new material to me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. I believe there was a, a question then posed to both uh, that uh, called for a remark from both Pichamon and Narilak. So maybe we can start with Pichamon. Sure. I don't think I can do justice to your comments um, and your question because it is indeed a very complex issue, as you've rightly acknowledged. Um, I do recognize that there is a lot of pressure um, on governments, but also on SMEs to meet those new and emerging requirements and that this is something that we can't reasonably expect them to do just on their own. And that's the reason why I think multi-stakeholder alliances are the way to go. And what we need to see in this space are innovative partnerships with rights holders, with CSOs, with NGOs on the ground, because they have the knowledge, the expertise that can help fill in some of those information gaps and gaps in understanding as well as to what is needed, where, when, and, and why. Um, so all of this, I know, again, is difficult to transfer from paper into practice, um, but this is where trust is needed, and I think you know, it goes both ways. Civil society needs to know that they can trust in businesses and in states to do the right thing, and vice versa. You know, I, know, I understand that businesses also need to know that NGOs or CSOs involved will, will do the right thing as well. So I can only really um, say that, which is that I do hope that this will provide impetus for us to explore new exciting opportunities for partnerships and cooperation in the space. Thank you. 
Thank you, Pichamon, and Kunarilak. Yes. Thank you for the comments and question. Um, in, in Thailand, in, 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 in preparation of the SME in to, to, to respond for the, for the change from the international trend in, in the mandatory human rights religion, we are as a Ministry of Justice as a core government agency in Thailand responsible for the um, business and human rights agenda. We were also alert by the Thai mission in Brussels, and also we were, I also myself received a lot of phone calls from the business and, and especially the SME side and the SME Federation concern and also Thai Chamber of Commerce as well on the, on the EU directive on the, on the mandatory human rights religion as well. I think there is some kind of confusion as well at the moment whether this is also ob obliged to the SME in Thailand or not. And we need to make sure and we need to explain to them as well. And starting from the end of last year, we organized a kind of national dialogue among in, in collaboration with the SME Federation of Thailand to explain to the business sector on this um, uh, movement in the global trend and also we uh, show the best example from different countries and also during the past year from the beginning of this year until now we regularly provide them with the um, um, knowledge on, on the, on the uh, de update on the information of the, of the um, EU as well and also we receive a request from Thai Chamber of Commerce from SME Federation to explain them about this and about the benefit and the uh, and what is the impact if they cannot um, follow the, 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 the EU directive as well. So I need, I think as a government, we need to provide them with uh, understanding and also full information and update information on this to, to, to make them prepare themselves. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ku Narelak. And I, I hope the government of Thailand will keep counting on support also from UNDP in providing these trainings on, on uh, human rights due diligence in general and indeed mandatory human rights due diligence also, also through uh, the project uh, which is funded indeed by the EU. So there is an interest in that project of, of bringing clarity in terms of what these uh, upcoming provisions uh, will bring. Um, I'd like to just offer an opportunity, if, if they want to seize it, to the two other speakers to say one final remark, if they want, uh, or to comment on any of the questions. If they um, feel like they want uh, to take the floor again, so please, Joyce, and then Shunsita, in case you want, also give you a minute. Yeah, Joyce. Thank you very much, Livio. Um, maybe just to put an, an emphasis at the risk of being repetitive <laughs> with our demands. Um, the legal recognition of indigenous peoples it remains to be a struggle here in Asia. And, at, and, and even when there are policies that protect and recognize their rights, they fail to, um, to materialize and actually protect their rights. Um, so I think it, but it remains to be a significant um, starting point to legally recognize indigenous peoples, their collective rights in self-determination and land, more than their uniqueness, the celebration of their uniqueness that is mostly for tourism purposes. Um, I think that was emphasized um, from the delegates from Thailand and as an indigenous woman from the Philippines, and that is also the same. And I think that's similar to um, to all other areas uh, where our uniqueness are celebrated, but our human rights um, are seen as a very different um, or a separate um, entity from our identity. And again, um, a call on the legal system at national, regional, and international level that is responsive um, and actually make duty bearers accountable as necessary is needed. Um, more than, and we sh uh, to see our work as an agent, uh, your, your agency as a person and your work should go beyond as a bureaucratic process within the, with the, wherever you work to actually maximize that agency and hopefully dream for a better system as mentioned earlier. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Joyce. And uh, the floor uh, one last time to Shunsita, please. Yes, um, I want to mention uh, regarding the informal sector, small and medium enterprise, I, I would suggest if the government can offer tax incentives and have a cohesive policy so that, and also have 
severe penalty as fines for non-compliance. Ultimately, it is the punishment or a kind of a non, uh, uh, what do you call the non-compliance part to actually have a penalty that will kind of strengthen the system and that system strengthening will ha help the rest of the corporations who actually get away. I mean, that sort of thing has to be controlled and that will help with tax incentives for small and medium enterprises. I thank you, thank you. A very, very uh, nice comment to, to end with, uh, coming from business, uh, pointing to penalties being uh, the, the, the lever of, uh, that needs to be earnest. Thank you all, and join me in giving a round of applause to all, all our great speakers today. Thank you. Mm.